Good evening. I hope you are ready for online Sunday school. As you see, we are considerably earlier. I mean, that is if you are see it. We usually have it quite a bit later. We're able to get around and get it a little sooner. My name is Karen Clymer with Elgin First Assembly of God, Elgin, Oklahoma. We're very glad to have you. If you do not have a church home, we would love to have you in Sunday school tomorrow, 945. We have classes for all ages. And then we have our, our worship service. It's at 1045. Tomorrow happens to be, or this, uh, February the 4th happens to be our, it's be the first Sunday of the month, and that's when we have our missions spotlight or an update. So we'll be having that, and we look forward to having you there. This is when we have put in our missions offering, and you can give, uh, like we have a bucket for the kids, and we always like to help the kids too. It's called Socks on a Mission, and if you have change, you put that in the sock or a box or whatever you've got, and we then put that in for each month, the first Sunday of every month, and at the end of the year then, or actually the first the first uh, week of the brand new year, we see how much is there and donate that to, to a particular missionary that's already been designated. And so then we're looking forward to just having a great preaching service, a great time in the Lord. So let's get right into our Sunday school lesson. Our lesson today is really, I appreciate this, the Spirit-empowered church. You know, this is uh, when Jesus left, you know, he had come, he died, uh, he came to earth, and he walked the earth, and he uh, he showed us he was the great example for us to follow. And, you know, he had work to do, but then there was more work to do, and he had gone to be with his Father, but the Holy Spirit was left to help us, our helper, to empower us that we could have church like we're supposed to have church. All right, so we get right into our lesson now. It is taken from... Our study text is, well, it's going to be from Luke and Acts, and I won't read all through those, but our central truth is this. The Holy Spirit empowers the church for effective ministry. You know, it's one thing. You can be famous, but are you effective? So we want to be, if it's, it's all right if we're famous, the main thing, though, is we want to be effective. Now, you can do your best like Jesus gave his best, and not everybody accepted. didn't mean he wasn't effective. There were those who did accept, but there are some people who, who, rebel, who rebel. They're rebels. They don't want anything. They want to run their own life. And they find out that that's not the best way. Our central truth, the Holy Spirit empowers the church for effective ministry. Key verse, Luke 24, 49. We'll read it in the King James Version and also the New Living Translation. I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry you in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. King James Version and now in the New Living Translation. Now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. Yes, that was something important to do, and he said, don't you dare leave Jerusalem until that happens. Our learning objectives, we will explore the work of the Holy Spirit in the beginning days and years of the church. We will identify and appreciate the diverse work of the Spirit in the church as he empowers believers. We, we will believe God for an expansion of the work of the Spirit in our own church. That's what we want. We want to have have that not just as somebody else does we appreciate what others have but we want to be doing our part and living up to what jesus wanted us to do so let's get into our lesson now so what would you say if someone asked you what is the church and said the truth is you could hear various things and i know once people might say oh well that's a church building down there no uh, well that's the building where we have church but others that you might, might, might say well it's the christians in the community and others would say, well, it's everybody that serves Jesus all around the earth. All, all, that's who it would be. And said some of those answers, they would have some truth in it. But the full definition of, of church is this, the living, active body of Christ in the, in the world, a community of faith following him together. The, church, the term church must include an element of activity and a sense of purpose being fulfilled. Like it's not just uh, not people in a building that serve the Lord, but that they're actually they have, they're doing something, they're active, and their purpose and all, and, and fulfilling that, reaching out to others and telling them the good news about Jesus. So we're going to get in. This is, uh, as we get in, into this unit, it's good to get into this and to study all this. just lot, got so many good things in it. So let's get started on this now. So we're going to go now to build with the Spirit. So I've talked about as Jesus prepared his followers to lead the church. He clearly described the Spirit's church, uh, the Spirit's work, they, they were about to begin, and he, but he told him, you must tarry. He said, don't you dare leave. That's what he was saying. You don't leave. He said, before, you know, he know he was going to ascend back to the Father, and he said, but you tarry in Jerusalem until you are filled with the, with the Holy Ghost. Now, they didn't really know what all 
to expect, he said, until you are, I use the word, endued with power from on high. So that this was something that they they were really, uh, you know, it was they didn't know exactly what was going to happen, but he said how important it was, and he impressed that on them, and it got hold of them, and they believed it, and they were going to follow through with what Jesus said. You know, God has his part, but the humans have their part. And Jesus picks, says, Luke 24, 46, picks up the story of Jesus when he appeared to his disciples after the resurrection. And he reminded them his, of the mission, of his mission. The prophets had foretold it. It wasn't like it was new. And he had to tell everybody, now this is, this is the deal. I'm, my father sent me to come. No, the prophets had already, uh, already prophesied that he was coming. Everything had happened as he had said. But now, now that he was going back to the Father, he wanted these people to know these disciples he had so faithfully trained. And they had, all of them had paid attention except one that went his own way. We know that was Judas, who, uh, who actually, I, in a sense, I could almost say that he, he despised him and how that he, he betrayed him and, and, and committed suicide. But now he said, this is what you're going to be doing doing he said you know the gospel is being passed on and you'll be preaching it to all the nations to all people that had also been prophesied about this uh, this holy spirit that would come that would be there so the apostle would play a central role in that they because you know why they were witnesses they were witnesses of his life and his death and uh, and his resurrection they had they knew all of that so they were the perfect people they could it wasn't hearsay they had seen it and they wrote these things down so the, the, uh, the, it wasn't just through human effort. It was the Holy Spirit. It was, that was the comforter that was there that makes all of the difference. The gospel mission could not happen through just human effort. You know, there are people that are good organizers. There are people that are good speakers. But there's nothing like having that Holy Spirit, that unction that behind it. It makes so much difference. Human words cannot carry the authority on their own. Effective preaching must be accompanied by power from heaven. And that's what they needed, this power from on high. And Jesus instructed those apostles to stay in Jerusalem where he would send the promise of his Father upon them. There's really something that uh, our scholars say that this is unusual. If it's a unique way to refer to the Holy Spirit, said it's not mentioned directly in the Greek here. said it indicates that it was the phrasing should use serves as emphasis, to emphasize the idea of divine promise, ensuring the disciples would not be required to undertake this mission on their own. Instead, they would be clothed with power from on high. You just think about that. And there is nothing like when the Holy Spirit just gives, when He comes, and you, you can't, you don't have to really explain it, but you know when it's there, and you know when it isn't, when the Holy Spirit is there. And you just, you have a clarity, you have a direction, and there is that power. It said they would be clothed with power from on high. Uh, said they, and they, the mission was vital to God's plan, central to the work of God's people, and only possible through the power of the Holy Spirit. And our writer brought out something I thought was very good. You had to be careful uh, that people didn't be, uh, just speak, see him as the Holy Spirit. It was just like their assistant. They could call on if and when needed. That's not it. You know, we, we, don't, we don't want to see that. We are, we are relying on the Holy Spirit. And that we need him at all. He's not just like an assistant. We have to know. He, he's, in, he's in charge. And we're going to follow him. We're going to study and pray and seek the face, face of God. Be thankful for the Father, the Son, and this precious Holy Spirit that is going to empower and help us to, to be effective in the ministry. And I already mentioned the fact that whether people accept or reject when we present the message up to them. And some people will reject, but there are those, thank the Lord, who will accept and will serve the Lord with joy and gladness. And when you go and when you read uh, on the day of Pentecost, you know, I, I think about this, what, were, what excitement it was when they were saying, well, they don't know, exactly know what to expect. They just really didn't know what, how it was going to happen, what it was going to be, how long they, was, it was, they would be there. Uh, and they just know that, uh, Jesus said, in a few days, you know, this was going to happen. But they didn't really know and told her they, they were to stay, wait, and, and they were not just, to, as we'd say, lollygag and slough around. They prayed. They sought the Lord. They wanted to be ready. They didn't really know what to expect. They just knew they were going to be endued with power from on high. How? What? When? How's it going to happen? Uh, but they had work to, to do. Uh, they had to choose. They had a business meeting to choose who was going to succeed Judas. And they had chosen that person. And it still hadn't happened, this, this, this endowment. It was going to be something they would know. It's not going to be like, 
well, I don't know if this, maybe it's happened and we didn't know. It wasn't one of those things. It was one that they were going to know beyond a shadow of a doubt. They would be endued with power from on high. It hadn't happened yet. What were they doing? They were praying. The Bible says they were in one mind and one accord. They were really seeking the Lord. And our writer brings out that it's significant that the event described in Acts 2 occurred on the day of Pentecost, which was one of three major Jewish feasts, the Feast of Weeks in Deuteronomy 16 and 16. And the Feast of the Pentecost took place seven weeks after Passover. The word Pentecost from, comes from the Greek word that means 50, signifying the 50 days between Passover and Pentecost. So because Pentecost celebrated the beginning of the harvest, it is also called the Feast of First Fruits. And a portion of those fruits, first fruits would then be presented to God as an offering. So here it happens, the day of Pentecost, Acts 2. Here it has happened. Now this, this the day of, of Pentecost, it came. Here it came. By the time of Christ, it mentioned that many Jews also used Pentecost to celebrate the giving of the law, and that was a good thing to do. You always want to remember those things. You want to worship them, but you want to remember them. And so here we can look, uh, again, the backdrop of God's covenant promises. We can look more deep into what was happening in Acts 2, 1 through 4. As they were gathered with one mind and one accord, waiting expectantly. You know, could this be the day? Nobody wanted to leave, leave the room. I think they just wanted to stay there. And I want, if you can read in the scriptures, you will find out here uh, that, that Jesus' mother was there. And oftentimes it, with some organizations, maybe they may look at she was some special one and, and you maybe wouldn't need it to have been there. And uh, I even think almost consider her to be almost deity. You don't see in any way scripture ever identifying her like that. Here she was there. She was, she was there just like everyone else. As she, was, she did carry the baby Jesus and, and raised the baby Jesus, but yet that he was the son of God. She was the one that gave birth to him, but she was there waiting just like the others. And it talked about here how the, the wind. And it mentioned here that in both Greek and Hebrew, the word for wind is often used of the spirit. In the first century, Jews often used the word heaven in reference to God to avoid saying God. I think they felt like it was always that they were it was they were too un, they, they were considered they weren't holy enough to even mention his name so the emphasis here is that the wind or spirit filling the gathering place is coming directly from god that's what they were saying and it was amazing when it came they found this heard the sound of a rushing mighty wind it wasn't just a little bit it was just a rushing mighty wind what went through their minds as they thought it's happening it's here this must be it and we went a good to have you on it's so did as those flames, there was flames of fire that settled on each of them. And I thought, now that must have been something to see, too. Uh, in the Old Testament, fire symbolized both God's judgment and God's refining work. But and this, this was tongues of fire that set up on each of them. And, and it mentioned here how in Acts, the fire of God signifies his approval of Jesus' followers. Uh, they, they were, he, he sanctioned as his sanctioned prophetic witnesses fit to bear his message. So that's, the, that's what the fire was. Something, it was a good thing. And we know God's judgment can come with fire. And then other times it's the refining work. So we're thankful that they were accepted the tongues of fire. It was approval here. Every person in attendance was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. This natural speech would be a sign and a witness to the crowds that were gathering there in, in Jerusalem. For Pentecost, they were from all different parts of the ancient world. And so you had all, all the, these various languages that were spoken there were people uh, just like uh, you know you and I would go into a crowd and like well when here you you can you speak uh, 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 the Filipino language I don't but but we both speak English <laughs> but if you heard me suddenly start speaking in in Filipino you know that I don't know the Filipino language you would know that was the Holy Spirit speaking through me you but it was a, a tremendous thing how that the people they looked around they said well what is this these were people from other nations they might have been Jewish people uh, that lived at other in other countries, and uh, but the thing was that they would, but they were here where they lived. They had a different tongue, you know, and maybe they were some of them were uh, young had been raised in another country, so they didn't really didn't know the, the the native tongue here, and so when they're hearing these people speak in their tongue that they know, and they knew that wasn't possible, they didn't know it. They recognized what this is. This is the Holy Spirit, and said. And what it turned out to be, so hearing these people praising God in the native tongues of many nations was irrefutable proof God was doing something special. The gospel would indeed be preached to all people. Praise the Lord. You know, I have heard of this, how that 
a, a person, a, a Christian person in more than one occasion, but I've heard of it. Uh, they were in a, another country. I'm, one of it was a military man. And here he didn't know these people that came up, and he was very fearful uh, for his life because he didn't know if they were friend or foe. And suddenly he began to speak in another language. And this, uh, he was a, Christ, a Christian, and he was a believer in the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And he began to speak in another language, and it turned out it was their language. And he didn't even know that language. But the Holy Spirit was guiding him and helping him because it wasn't time for him to to go yet he had a plan for him and I don't recall now if the people did accept the word or not but it was a miracle how God was using him but that day everyone was filled with the Holy Spirit and that would include uh, that would include Jesus mother Mary empowered to serve God's people it is not this we sit around and they, it's not that they then said well let's just go to church and let's just do this all day long no the Lord has you know there's there's times and places there's things to do Yes, every day they were going to worship. Every day they were going to praise God. This was brand new. They had so much to do. And now, as now this, as they begin to spread this glorious gospel, now because you didn't have to wait until somebody learned this, this, this language and all here, as these people now, they had heard the gospel, they had heard the truth, and it was in their language, so they could go back and they could preach and teach what they had been taught. Pentecostals sit off and focus on the role of the Spirit in equipping us for evangelism and missions. But the church, but the Spirit equipped the early church for a wide array of ministries, and the same is true today. And that's what it talks about in our lesson. So important that we remember uh, not only the outward reach, but the inward reach. And that's here. Yes, they were. They were filled. Now these people left, and they had heard the good message, and, and, and the and tongues and interpretation had come, how that they began to speak in other tongues, and they, they recognized their tongue, and, and they knew what, what to do. They were given guidance and help. But here at the church, there were so many people now. There was a great influx of people had come in. So you had, uh, now it's, it is mentions here that every church has needy people among the congregation. And so you have the outreach. They were trying to get the gospel out. But of this church here, there must have been, uh, they did not forget that they had an inward ministry as well. The early church provided a good example of meeting the needs. That's apparently they already had some, because there had been such an influx of people come in. Well, there was those, you know, that probably probably the language thing was one thing because after the infilling of the Holy Spirit, I'm talking just daily moving about within the community, uh, then uh, they there was a language culture, uh, language problem, language as well as culture problem. And so they had to help them as the, as the Jews. Uh, they felt like sometimes they were, you know, but there was an issue, there were, they, you know, how they had a resentment toward, toward the Gentiles. But the Lord was working. He was working on that. And you're going to see how he's moving into that. But the language division was probably something that was there too because just uh, in this one, just dealing with everyday business, there was issues there. So they had to work on that. And so the congregation, they came together and they said, uh, we've got an issue here. Said our people are not being served because you know the Gentiles were not really looked down on. And they said our people are not being, not being looked out for. And said they're in great need too. And so what they did, they, what do they do now? You have the Holy Spirit to go to. They begin to pray, and they sought the Lord, and the Lord gave them a plan. That's the Holy Spirit was there to quicken them with a plan. One thing I will say when you go through uh, these things, cultural type things and, and adjusting and all, but as children of God, you work through those things. It may not happen like overnight, but it will be that growing in the Lord. You know, we, it takes time to grow. As you seek the Lord, and they begin to help each other. And that seven administrators will say, which was chosen out of that time of prayer and seeking, Holy Spirit, what do you want? How do we settle this issue? They told them to choose out seven administrators, and we would call them deacons, and commission them in prayer. And mentioned notably one of these men was Stephen. And listen to how he was described. A man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. That's a good reminder that these early Christians... They wanted somebody. They valued the spirits involved, their spirits' involvement. They already recognized the power of the Holy Spirit and the difference it made. Now, anybody can just, you can just go through uh, the motions, and you might have people that are good at organizing and planning. They might put something together, but that's not like when the Holy Spirit is guiding and directing. He knows minute details. And this is what was happening here. As the Holy Spirit had given them guidance, and now these people said in every aspect of ministry, not just preaching and teaching, in this case, the Holy Spirit provided wisdom for administering outreach, restoring equity, and maintaining unity in the body. Unity was so important. 
that's what the Lord wanted. You had this great influx of people all of a sudden, and now you'd had the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and that had been marvelous how God had moved, and now you get down to daily business, and that's when we, st really, we still really need the Holy Spirit to guide us and direct us, and He's there. So after the believers' meeting, the Word of God spread, and the number of believers increased rapidly. So this validated the decision of the apostles. What did they do? They sought the Holy Spirit to guide them. They recognized the Holy Spirit was there to help them. And what happened? As a result, the church flourished. It prospered. It was blessed. And that's what we need to remember. Empower, empowered to lead. And ask the question here, what do you look for in a godly leader? And uh, you, know, you stop and think about it, and we could uh, get hung up on that for a good while. What Some people would look for this and some people for that. But what does the scripture tell us what, what they, they were looking for? Uh, we might be tempted to answer the question with a list of characteristics to make an effective speaker or preacher. But no, that's not what, what 1 Timothy 3 and 8 through 13 reminds us. Christian leadership must include, include spiritual virtues. It mentions the word deacon in 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13. It comes from the Greek word for servant. So these were to be, deacons were to be servant leaders and within the church. And so and often they would be dealing with tangible needs. And it wasn't just spiritual needs. I mean, those are so vitally important. But what about tangible needs that people would have? You know, that's, uh, there, what about situations when all of a sudden, we're well, just like recently, we just heard just like today, a friend called me and told me about uh, a fellow that uh, that I, I knew a little bit, but she knew very, very well, and how that he had died pretty suddenly. Uh, just uh, I learned uh, later that he, he didn't, hadn't even known two weeks, uh, that he just had a few days to live. Hadn't even known he was sick. And some, something came up that alerted him, went to the doctor, and he was gone in less, less than two weeks' time. Well, now you have a uh, family here, you know, especially you, they need to be reached out to. Yes, they love the Lord. It's a family that loves the Lord and serves the Lord. But what? They need special care, special attention at this time. Uh, and many things will be involved. But note how the qualifications for deacons resembles the fruit of the Spirit. A deacon should be what? Self-controlled in personal behavior, and in spiritual practice. Also, faithfulness will be evident in matters of family and the Christian faith. And 1 Timothy 3 and 9 states the deacon should be committed to the mystery of the faith. Salvation through faith in Jesus Christ is a mystery in that it is only known to the revelation of the Holy Spirit, both in God's Word and in the human heart. You know, I'm telling you what salvation is. It is the, the, the mystery of God. You think the mystery of godliness and how He can can change a person that lives in, in deepest, darkest sin. and change. The mystery of godliness. Thank the Lord. The mystery of grace. Just what the Lord does. Deacon is to be wholly committed to salvation in belief and behavior alike. So that the qualifications for deacon teach us the Holy Spirit intends to empower every aspect of the church. It's not we just know how to do this. And we don't look at this and say, oh, well, we know, we're, we've lot, we're, we know a lot more than that. In our, in our culture, we, we can handle this. We don't need to go to the Holy Spirit. Oh, no, no. We, we all need the Holy Spirit, uh, at whatever we do. And I think it was what Brother Thomas said the other day that a preacher has, uh, had said that he wanted the Holy, he, he needed the Holy Ghost and just to go to Walmart. Anywhere, no, he's in other words, where, whatever I do, all day, every day, if I'm at home, if I'm out and about, I want the Holy Spirit to guide. He may want us to speak to somebody, to reach out to somebody. He may uh, speak to our heart, impress on us to turn this way or turn that way. And God will have us there to meet and to minister to someone. It's not just evangelism and preaching. The Spirit must enable the work of spiritual leaders, whether they're preaching a sermon, leading a Sunday school class, resolving disputes, stewarding finances, or disciplining young, young believers. God just, He just has helped us. I thank Him so much for the Holy Spirit that leads and guides and quickens us. I'm thankful for that quickening of the Holy Spirit. Just immediately you know the mind of God, what He wants you to do. We need to walk with Him, live in the Spirit, and walk in the Spirit. Part number three, empowered to spread God's Word. It wasn't just stay right there. That's what they were bad to do. You know, they was having such a good time. You know, they were just worshiping there, and they was coming to church, and they were just daily in the church, and they was just... Uh, I, they was having like revival every day. It was so good. They was just basking in it. But you know when they had to, because what had they been told to go into all the world and spread and spread the gospel, this good news. Uh, but it was so good just to go to church and 
praise the Lord and worship and all, but they weren't doing all of them what they were supposed to. Yes, you needed church here, but what happened? They begin to be uh, the things how that they begin to bring some some bad things begin to happen. You know, not everybody liked this this new doctrine. Not every so they're not everybody believed it. Not everybody wanted to be Christians. No, but not everybody li liked what they said. So what happened? Persecution began to come to the church. So what happened? They left. That's what the Lord had told them to do. Go ye into all the world. Yes, you needed the church there. This is where the apostles were primarily going to be. Well, what happened is the church, they began to go out and begin to spread the gospel everywhere. Just begin, everywhere they would go, they would talk about the Lord Jesus. They would spread the, this good news. And here was these, uh, well, here's a place that talked about how the, the Lord spoke as the disciples as they prayed at this one place, what when the Holy Spirit spoke to them, that it, the Lord had a work he needed. He needed something to happen here. He, he needed Paul, and it chose him a worker that they were to go, and they were to go and to spread some em, empower. They were empowered with wisdom and, and guidance. That's what just barriers were to be broken down wherever they went, and it was something how the Lord used that, and they went. And some of these people were not considered the ones that, were really considered the very best at all, especially when they went any kind of Gentiles or the Samaritans. That was just horrible, they thought. No, all oh, those people can't even be saved. Oh, but they could. And the Holy Spirit was quickening people to go and to minister to them. And there was also deliverance from evil spirits and healing from paralysis. And everywhere the, the Holy Spirit, everywhere they went with the Holy Spirit, guided these people. Spiritual and physical needs were met. And this it, it was a how important it was to maintain, as it mentioned here, a proper perspective when it comes to the supernatural. And I like how our writer says, and God delivers and heals because of his compassion for people. That's consistent with his nature. And But the fundamental purpose of miracles is to testify to the reality of the kingdom of God. Thank the Lord. And to point people to Jesus. Then he ushers them from spiritual darkness into the light. And as children of God, they should see the light of the glorious gospel shining through us. Barriers are broken down. It's Especially when they went to these Samaritans, as I said, that was just considered uh, beyond all that the Samaritans, you know, oh, these people, you know, that they could be, you know, they were they were part Jew, and here they, uh, you know, because they had been, the country, how it had been taken over, and they'd been in bondage, and so they had married, these Jews had married here, and, to the, and they were Samaritans, and they were just looked down on so much, but Jesus loved those people, and he said, say, he said, it's, goes, it's for everybody. So empowered with wisdom and guidance, it focused on, on, it often focused on the supernatural, but it focused on wanting to get everybody, bring divine wisdom and guidance, whatever was needed and wherever it was needed. And that's when these missionaries, as I mentioned, they were called out. And it, it was something who, how also, too, uh, that Philip was one of those that had called out, been called out as one of the of, of those deacons and how that you know Stephen he was one he he performed miracles and and he was one of the deacons and now here you had Philip the same way he was letting God use him in such a special way he reached out to him and got, and he began to take the gospel and the Lord how he anointed him and blessed him and strengthened him and how as he spread this gospel and had he had he had uh, major miracles and victories because of what he had done in faith and trust and confidence in God. And what happened? Why did he go? He had been led by the Holy Spirit, had quickened him to go and to do that. And it mentions here, and there in Samaria, as I said, the location is key because the Jews had so often rejected the Samaritans because of their ancestry. But I'm so thankful that but through the Holy Spirit, this is how that we understand that how the people... You notice the Holy Spirit, he, he doesn't, he's not prejudiced, and he isn't looking down on this one or, and lifting this one up, but it was all peoples, all ranks, it didn't matter what your name, rank, or serial number was, it didn't matter what your nationality was, and that's what the Holy Spirit does, and when you see people that hold back and they say, well, they don't go somewhere because of this or that, uh, they'll name about them because they would be, they would reject, or you know, that, you know they are, and they call Maybe some group of people do it. But that's not what the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit reaches out to everybody. Now, he may not be, he might not call me to, to go to a, to a particular one. Not that I have anything against any of them, but he knows who is best suited to work. And this was these people. Now, here they probably, in the, 
they wouldn't have had anything to do with these people. But now, look at Philip. He had been chosen as one of the deacons of Mary, shared the message of Christ, and how that God, that miracles were wrought because of this, of his obedience. The Lord blessed him and helped him in a wonderful way. So it's so good to just, and it talks here about his message. And he was brought, the Samaritans were eager to hear Philip's message. Why? He wasn't there to condemn them and tell them, you know, you can't, this salvation is not for you. But he was there to tell them, it is for you. Hey, listen, it's for you. They had been so rejected for so long, they had no idea they would even have any opportunity. But here was this wonderful message. They were drawn to him. You know, one thing that did it was by the miraculous signs. Not that he did them, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the sign, miraculous signs, including deliverance from evil spirits and healing from paralysis. When they saw these miracles and his love that he had, and he didn't say, I did this, but he pointed them to Jesus Christ. And he said, and, this, and then when he went away, said he died, he was killed, and he was murdered, he was put on a cross and crucified, he was buried. Three days he was raised from the dead. He walked among us then for 40 days then, said, We'd walked with him on this earth for like three years. He was buried. Uh, how they killed him and buried him. And now he was rose, risen from the dead. We had 40 days with us. And he just told us more and more and just kept impressing on us the importance of, of having this Holy Spirit. And, uh, and Philip, just he just he just spread the glorious gospel to them. And when I believe they felt the love of God from him, but even if he had resented Samaritans and uh, people of other cultures before he didn't now i don't know if he ever did or he didn't but now i know this that he, he doesn't he may have had but now because he saw that jesus didn't the holy spirit the father son and holy spirit all work together they don't ever have to have a meeting and say and one say well i don't agree with that there's not any of that that threefold cord i mean they are they are in total agreement the holy spirit was meeting people's spiritual and physical needs and so here, this man, Philip, was doing a great work, and he let the Lord use him in spite of what there might have been people said, now, look where he went. Those people, they cannot possibly, the Lord couldn't possibly save him. Oh, but he could say, testify, yes. And those people, as their lives were changed, as they were being taught and trained, you know, this is one thing we can't forget. You don't just leave a baby Christian just to grow on their own any more than you would leave a baby in a baby bed just to grow on their own. They don't have to be taught and trained and helped. That's the same way with Christians. Well, new, brand new Christians. So it mentions the fundamental purpose of miracles is to testify to the reality of the kingdom of God and to point people to Jesus. Then he ushers them from spiritual darkness into the spiritual light. We've already alluded to that. But anyway, empowered with wisdom and guidance. So this may this be our heart and our desire. The Apostle Paul as he was and his partner was, was taken there as they chose that day for, for Paul and his uh, the, another Christian brother there was named Bar Barnabas and how that they left on their first missionary journey. The church today must rely on the Holy Spirit just as much as they did back then. It can't be well now in our in our culture and you know we we know how to do this and we don't we have to watch that we don't think that we already know how or that we can just look and see what they did. What we can look and see yes they went where they were told to go but now well, in our day and time you know, it, where does, what does he want us to do? How does he want us to do it? So may the Lord help us to look clear. He's, and the Apostle Paul exhorts Timothy to keep a clear mind. You know, that's so important. And we might talk about sometime too, just good old common sense. But said, uh, keep a clear mind. In 2 Timothy 4 and 5, this is a call to remain sober and strong in the faith regardless of the situation. Although fears can arise from outside threats or, or our own uncertainty or insecurity, we need not be afraid but to keep putting our trust in God just like they did. That we can carry out God's plan. The Holy Spirit is with us wherever we go and whenever we need to go there. God wants us to move forward. He has a plan of action for us. I want to move with God, work with God, go with God, and know that He will go with us. That we ask Him each day, Lord, what will you have me to do? Lord, I'm here to do what you say, how you say, when you say every day all day every day what is this what is God saying to us without the Holy Spirit the church would be little more than an organization of people doing religious work you know there are a lot of those out there but they may be well-meaning but they do not depend on and don't even believe in the Holy Spirit we must check ourselves daily to ensure our priorities and passion come from the Spirit and not our own desires you know we, we may see a need and, and it may be a definite need 
but maybe the, the people aren't ready to receive. Uh, there's just, as we seek the Lord, we want to know. We don't want to just jump into something without knowing positively. That's what the Lord wants. Now, you know, anytime we're around people, we want to be the same. We want to be believers in our words and in our deeds. But the Lord could look, just pray every, I think we need to pray every day, Lord, before, when I get ready to go into town, if, even if you go to the post office, whatever you're going to do, Lord, help me to be an example of a believer in my words and my deeds. Lord, help us touch, I want to be able to touch people for you every day. Kelly, glad to see you on, and I'm just finishing up, and you must have been busy and couldn't get on, and so I was able to get around earlier tonight, I was so glad. So I won't get in bed. It's real, 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 real late. Yeah, I didn't get much sleep last night. All right. Let's go now to our living it out. Find uh, ministry in action. Find new ways you can serve someone in need this week. Number two, offer to pray with someone in need of a miracle. Three, pray each day that the Lord will help you be more attuned to the voice of the Spirit as you fulfill your role in the body of Christ. Okay. Oh, Kelly, your son is there. I'm so happy for you. And I'm going to go ahead and make a, an announcement for Kelly. Had sent me a message last night, and we've been praying for her friend Kathy. She was she did get out of the hospital and is home, and so happy to be home. And I, you know, she that she's been several since several weeks. And Kelly, you might know exactly how many weeks, but it was it was several weeks. She was in the hospital. And there she had Guillain-Barré syndrome, sometimes known as GBS. Therefore, time couldn't even move, as I understand. Couldn't walk, couldn't even move her arms, maybe. Just really a, a terrible situation. We prayed for her. Our church prayed, and I'm sure don't tell another, many others were praying. But we're so thankful the Lord intervened and touched her. And uh, All right. Oh, yes. Okay, Kelly said she went in the hospital the week before Christmas. So this was a long time to be in the hospital and you know, to finally be free and be home again. My, there's just absolutely no place like home. Just glad to be home. So I'm glad you can be there for her, too. So, all right. Well, that concludes our lesson uh, tonight. And so if you do not have a church home, we hope that you can be with us at Elgin First Assembly of God, Elgin, Oklahoma, 945 for Sunday school, 1045 for worship. And then in our evening service, it begins at 6 o'clock. All right. You have a great rest of the day and our evening. And we will see. We plan to go ahead and get this uploaded right away to YouTube, Rumble, and Twitter. It takes just a little while, though. So you be blessed. Until next time.